Harvard, who has a question from, for Kellyanne. My question has to do with President-elect Trump's communication strategy, uh, specifically if he's going to continue using his uh, Twitter account. I know it breeds a lot of authenticity, um, but he's also been known to, uh, to tweet out falsehoods and, and other uh, a liabilities. So is that something that he plans to do after inaugurated? So that's going to be up to him, the Secret Service, and uh, others who have to help decide those issues. I will tell you that uh, the president-elect looks at his social media accounts, a combined 25 million or probably more at this point, users on Twitter and Facebook as a very good platform through which to convey his messages. Um, I can tell you firsthand that there are posts that he makes that otherwise would not be heard or seen by those 25 million people but for him posting them. But, you know, he's a unique person who's been following his instincts and his judgment from the beginning. I think one of the, one of the points that I think we'd all be interested in hearing is in the last week he tweeted that there were millions of fraudulent votes. There's no evidence that there were millions of fraudulent votes. I don't doubt that there were some fraudulent votes. There always are. But the idea that the only reason Hillary Clinton won the popular vote is because of millions of fraudulent votes is not true. Uh, and then when CNN reported on that, he started retweeting people criticizing Jeff Zeleny, our reporter, um, including a 16-year-old boy. Um, and I think the question arises in a room full of people who want President-elect Trump to succeed, who want him to realize a vision where there are more jobs coming into this country, where you do achieve so much of what you want to achieve. Is that really presidential behavior? Well, he's the president-elect, so that's, that's presidential behavior, yes. So the and things I that Bill Clinton did that in the I Oval Office the that you criticized, th those were presidential? Are you actually comparing what Bill Clinton did in the Oval You're Office You're saying if the president does Twitter it, feed? it's presidential. Shall, I'm we saying, re shall we review for those who weren't born then what President Clinton did in I'm the Oval Office? I'm saying just because a president does something doesn't make it presidential. Yes, I wasn't saying otherwise. But the fact is this man is now president of the United States. <laughs> And he's tackling very big issues, the ones that he campaigned on and the ones that he will execute through his one, first 100-day plan. I know him very well. I'm a trusted advisor. He is committed to making good on the promises and on, the, on, the, on frankly, the plans. And he's going to be focused on that. We need to move on and support the president and the initiatives that he's going to, to make. I, I, didn't like, I don't like a lot of things that people in leadership do, but they're there. And that should be respected. I mean, I was raised to respect the office of the president and its current occupant, no matter who he or she is. Jake, I, I just hope moving forward from this campaign, you know, Kellyanne is right. The campaign's over. It's time to move on. I just hope the truth doesn't get lost or sacrificed. Hillary Clinton's campaign blames FBI Director James Comey for her loss, but it was the revelations of the email scandal that behind the scenes split her top advisors. We'll have more on that next. We begin this morning with a woman who has become the face of the presidential transition. Kellyanne Conway, Donald Trump's former campaign manager, joins us now from his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida. Good morning. Good and morning. Let me start with something that a New York Times news story said was false. Donald Trump tweeted the other day, if Russia or some other entity was hacking, why did the White House take so long to act? Why did they only complain after Hillary lost? But the National Intelligence Director James Clapper did say in October, did formally accuse the Russians of hacking during the campaign. So how do you reconcile those two statements? They are easily reconcilable. I mean, let's look at... President Obama's own final press conference on Friday, Howie, he stopped short of saying that Russian hacking actually interfered in the election in a way that switched the election results toward Hillary Clinton. He was unwilling to do that, which puts the president himself at odds with many in his party. I would say even Hillary Clinton now is telling donors at her party or wake, whatever you want to call it, the other night in Manhattan, that uh, Russian hacking affected the election results. No, it did not. And she knows that she ignored Wisconsin. A people, she ignored Michigan, which uh, President Obama won by 10 points four short years ago, and right. Donald Trump just won. Well, I don't so, suggest... So, look, if, these intelligent, if the intelligence community wants to be serious about this and produce evidence to the American people, we, of course, will look at that. They were invited to a House intelligence briefing and didn't show up. They'd rather leak to the media. That should bother people who are running around on their high horses, beating their chest, saying that they are genuinely concerned about 
not undermining our democracy. Yeah, no Come forward, go and testify where you should behind closed doors, and stop leaking to the media. And no question the fact that these leaks have really added to the murkiness surrounding this rather than on the record statements from administration officials. You went off on White House spokesman Josh Earnest the other day after he said, well, look, Trump obviously knew during the campaign the Russians were hacking the DNC emails, that this was hurting Hillary's campaign, and even that Trump had invited. Uh, Russian hackers to find her deleted emails. Why did you respond so strongly to Ernest? Representing the White House from the podium, how he would say that he knew what Donald Trump knew and that Donald Trump obviously knew it. How does he know that? And in fact, it was his own president, his own boss, President Obama, the next day coming out and saying, Look, I told Vladimir Putin to quote, cut it out or knock it off at some international conference, and he did. But, you know, when Donald Trump made that comment tongue-in-cheek about going and getting her emails, Podesta's emails were already in the main. And I would point out for your viewers, because nobody talks about it for many reasons, it was a pro-Hillary outside group that used Colin Powell, the former Secretary of State's hacked emails, to try to help her in this election that... He questioned Benghazi, and he, they, took, they tried to cherry-pick some of his emails right. to make it seem that, you know, to, to help her, although, unfortunately for her, he had, Colin Powell had many criticisms of his right. successor, right, right, Hillary right. Clinton at state. But, you know, we just can't have it three different ways because people can't get over these election results. Vladimir Putin had nothing to do with the fact that Hillary Clinton underperformed with union households, underperformed with women as the first female president, certainly underperformed with white voters, underperformed with the Obama constituency. Okay, no need and to look, let me just say much. something else. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. All right, let me just turn, and you can come back to that, but I want to turn to the lead story in the Washington Post today. Last-ditch bid to upend vote. This, of course, is about the formality of the Electoral College meeting tomorrow. And two uh, pretty respected columnists at the Washington Post, E.J. Dion on the left and Kathleen Parker on the center right, have embraced the idea of GOP electors going rogue to block or overturn Donald Trump's victory. What do you make of that and all the coverage that this is getting? Well, rather listen to people who aren't the electors, I would go and look at the quotes of the electors. They're in many different publications this week and weekend, Hallie, where it's any, it's any combination of I will respect the will of the voters in this state that voted for Donald Trump and giving him all the electoral votes in that particular state. In some states, there's a penalty if you don't abide the will of the voters. And other people knowing that this is just one last ditch effort, very desperate gas to turn around the election results and make them what everybody said they were going to be because they totally missed this election, they totally missed the data that were obvious, and they totally missed who America is and what they want in their presidency. Uh, I, I would note you've got these sort of out-of-work actors and actresses embarrassing themselves this week. One guy played the president on a drama called The West Wing. He's not the president going to the West Wing. That's Donald Trump. So it's getting a little out of hand. So if you hear about that, I think what Sheen, they're trying course. to do is disrespecting, well, you can mention his name, but I, look, they're disrespecting and undermining democracy more than any other allegation because they're actually trying to do this. But I, people talk about this every four years. We're not worried about it because we take everything no, like that very seriously. It's a non -story. Our attorneys are, it's, it's a, a non story. By the way, it wasn't a squeaker, folks. Get over it. He All needed right. 270 electoral votes. We, we got a 36 cushion in there, 306, let not a try, squeaker. Let me try to get some other topics in in our remaining time. Republican spokesman Sean Spicer, working with you all, says uh, your team is looking at whether there's still going to be a need for daily White House press briefings. Maybe they don't need to be televised. Um, I understand the arguments, but isn't that the one chance? that reporters get every day to try to get answers to questions from a top administration official? No, no, not necessarily, because if you look at the last couple of press secretaries, they have the daily briefings, but they don't necessarily answer the questions, do they? I mean, some of these Sometimes. people are deflecting and denying, and, uh, but, but there are many ways to communicate with the press, and obviously many ways for the press to communicate with us. Uh, you've got a you've got a president elect who's very powerful on Twitter. People criticize him, but boy, do they cover every single tweet he puts out there. And boy, does it move mountains, literally and figuratively. But w look, this is Donald Trump, unconventional candidate, no military political experience. America looked at that as a bonus. He's going to shake up Washington. It could be an unconventional White House, but we will be respectful to the press. We just expect the same in and return. Frankly, for most of them, we're yet to say it. Speaking of communicating with the press, I mean, Donald Trump used to routinely criticize Hillary Clinton for going months without a press conference. He has not held a news conference since July. Is that going to change anytime soon? Perhaps. 
But we used to we used to like to smoke her out to have press conferences because they were so awful. We just thought it helped us if she actually had them. You know, everybody was focused on the wrong point there. All right. The record will show that your answer was perhaps. Uh, real quickly, uh, New York Times columnist Paul Krugman wrote the following on Twitter. Uh, there was, rightly, he says, a cloud of illegitimacy over Bush. George W. Bush, dispelled wrongly by 9-11, creates some interesting incentives for Trump. Donald Trump uh, called Krugman demented on this. What's your reaction to the, that kind of rhetoric? That kind of rhetoric has no place in our democracy, frankly, no place in, in media. And here's why. He is taking on the President of the United States and accusing him of doing something or thinking in a certain way that's not just false, but it's dangerous. And I would ask everybody in the media, do you have editors anymore? What are the standards here? Whether you look at people's Twitter feeds, which are a hot mess, against the president-elect and, and inaccurate and really just for other journalists, frankly, the public doesn't read them much. Uh, or you have columnists who clearly wanted a different election result accusing the president of something. That's just very dangerous to our democracy. And I would say for everybody who's beating their chest and all high-minded about undermining our democracy, they should think about these, these, these hot words. Uh, I would like for him to apologize, but I would also like for the New York Times to get their arms around this and say, is this, a, is this an appropriate way right. to speak about the president-elect? All right, we'll see if Paul Krugman apologizes. And finally, Kellyanne, in our remaining minute, uh, you've said that uh, one reason that you've been reluctant to take a job in the White House, you have turned down the job of press secretary, we don't know if you're going to take some other position, um, is that you have four children between the ages of 7 and 12. Well, some female critics in the name of feminism kind of jumped on you and accusing you of saying that no mother with children should ever work in the White House. I lost him. Have Tell me when to answer and I will. I know what he's asking. Yeah. Go ahead. Keep going, Howie. Okay. Oh. Um, the, the I lost you for a second, but I think you're asking about, right, um, well, some of them are childless, so I appreciate their non-advice. And for others who felt the need to tell us all about their breastfeeding schedule, that's weird. I did that four times, but don't need to, don't need to share the details. Look, these are personal decisions. At the core of feminism, is supposed to be that we all make our own choices, privately and deliberately, whatever is best for us and our families. And by the way, for some people, families include elderly relatives or siblings yeah. who need them, who, mm -hmm. who maybe are ill. It's not always children, and I'm respectful of that. But I want to put, I want to, put this to rest in this way. I work for a man, President-elect Donald Trump, Vice President-elect Mike Pence, who are incredibly supportive and are creating a very family-friendly White House and West Wing for any working mother who would like to be there. This is just a personal decision based on the ages and the needs of my own children. But if I go inside, I'm completely confident that I will be respected, that I won't have to pretend that I don't have children. And a lot of women out there in our workforce of over 300 million mm -hmm. Americans, Howie, don't have that same privilege. All they right. simply don't. You see a lot of people in corporate America have these handbooks. We're family friendly. And the minute you try to go to a dance recital or a baseball game, they say, oh, it's not listed on page 862. Yeah. All right. Everyone Donald should Trump make their has wor working daughters and daughters-in-laws, and he respects this. Everyone should make their own choices. I'm going to agree with that. On that note, Kellyanne Conway, thanks very much for joining us from Mar-a-Lago. Thank you. Good to see you.